Well, good afternoon, everyone. It is a great pleasure for me to welcome you all. My name is Father David Hollenbach, and I teach here at Georgetown in the School of Foreign Service, and I am also uh, affiliated with the Berkeley Center uh, for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs, working on issues of uh, social justice and peace and refugee issues in particular in my own case. So welcome to being here for this, this continuing dialogue with our distinguished visitor, uh, Archbishop Silvano Tomasi. We are here this afternoon to discuss a really urgent issue that is facing us in the world today, namely the displacement of refugees and the major movement of migrants in our world. As many of you know, the number of refugees in the world today is at an all-time high. We have some 67 plus million displaced people, refugees and internally displaced in our world today, which is the highest number uh, in recent history, certainly the highest since the Second World War. And the number of migrants is also extraordinary. In 2015, the number of migrants, which means those living outside the country of their birth, reached 244 million people. This is the reason why one distinguished author has called our day the age of migration. So we are here to discuss those questions. Also, today, Pope Francis is launching a major initiative from the Catholic community to address these issues of refugees and migration. Today, in the, Holy, in the Vatican City, at midday, in his address, he launched what he calls the Share the Journey campaign, a campaign which is meant to be the engagement of the Catholic community and its other collaborating people from Christian and non-Christian denominations, an interfaith initiative that will address this question of migration and refugees uh, in our world, to try to respond to the movement of people, as he said, without fear, the fear that leads to so often excluding those who are different from who we are. Now, migration is, of course, a very old story. It has been happening since the beginning of human history. But the realities of today mean that it has become a particularly urgent sign of the times of the world we're living in today. And in his encyclical letter, Laudato Si, caring for our common home on environmental questions, Pope Francis wrote, all it takes is one good person to restore hope. Well, today we have four good people here to help us restore hope. And I would like to introduce them to you and then we'll open it up to their comments and to your comments as well. We want to be very interactive in our discussion this afternoon. I got to know Archbishop Silvano Tomasi through his role in a conference I organized in Boston some years ago on the plight of refugees, where he contributed an outstanding essay on Catholic perspectives on the rights of refugees to the book that that conference produced. Today, Archbishop Tomasi serves at the Holy See at the Vatican in the Vatican's Office for Promoting Integral Human Development which addresses the church's approach to justice and peace, including justice for migrants and refugees. Formerly, immediately before taking this position he's now in, he served as the permanent observer, or you might say ambassador, of the Holy See to the United Nations offices in Geneva, in particular to where he interacted with the office of the High Commissioner for Refugees in, uh, in Geneva. And his earlier positions took him to Ethiopia and Eritrea, 
He worked uh, for a number of years here in the United States with the U.S. Bishops' Conference and their Office on Migration and Refugees. He holds his Ph.D. from Fordham University, where he studied on migration issues. So I know that Archbishop Tomasi is one of the best informed Roman Catholic thinkers about the topic we are going to address today, so we're really privileged to have him with us. Let me introduce our other panelists, and then we'll move directly into our discussion with each other. Dr. Elizabeth Ferris, to my immediate left, is research professor at Georgetown's Institute for the Study of International Migration and a fellow at the Brookings Institution in Foreign Policy. She was, before coming to Georgetown, co-director of the Brookings Institution's project on internal displacement, working uh, with a very distinguished set of colleagues there, uh, including with Francis Modding Deng, a very distinguished Sudanese uh, who was, for a while, the High uh, Commissioner for Prevention of Genocide with the United Nations. Before she came to Brookings uh, and ultimately to Georgetown, she worked at the World Council of Churches as director of their immigration and refugee program, and she also worked with Church World Service uh, in New York. She has been a Fulbright professor at the Universidad Autónoma in Mexico City and has written uh, uh, or edited six books, including most recently the Consequences of Chaos, Syrian Displacement, and the Failure to Protect. So the reality of the Syrian refugee crisis is very well known uh, to Professor uh, Ferris. Our th third panelist is Father Ludovic Lado, who is a member of the Society of Jesus, a Jesuit. He is uh, the visiting Jesuit professor at Georgetown this semester. He is a social anthropologist, originally from Cameroon, now based in Cote d'Ivoire in Abidjan. I had the privilege of teaching him both in Nairobi at Hakima College and in Boston at the Western Jesuit School of Theology where I taught for many years uh, and know that he is an outstanding, not only outstanding student, but outstanding scholar and a very vigorous activist as well. Um, he has his doctorate in anthropology from Oxford University, and his work on social justice particularly concerns governance in African countries, uh, in particular his indigenous country of Cameroon and other parts of West Africa. He's written a number of books, including Catholicism in West and Central Africa in the 21st Century, He's presently at the Center for Research and Action for Peace in Abidjan, in Cote d'Ivoire, and he's now a visiting professor here at Georgetown, as I said. Our final panelist is Habon Ali. Habon Ali is a senior here at Georgetown as an undergraduate, doing her bachelor's degree and simultaneously a master's level student in a five-year BSMS program in foreign service at the School of Foreign Service, working in regional and comparative studies with a focus on poverty and world economy. And she's also very engaged in the question of the role of women and women's rights. She's been a research assistant to one of our distinguished faculty members who happens to be with us uh, this afternoon and working on migration in the Horn of Africa. She herself is from Kenya, and her, where she was born in Garissa, in northwest Kenya, up, excuse me, northeast Kenya, up on the border with Somalia. And her family, part of her family, have been refugees from Somalia into, into Kenya. So she knows from family background the reality of the migration and refugee issue. She is also serving today as an intern with the Jesuit Refugee Service here in Washington, and she is vice president of Georgetown's Muslim Students Association. So we have a very interesting perspective coming from Habon Ali. 
One other thing before we begin, I would like to announce, just list the sponsors of this event. Uh, the Berkeley Center for Religion, Peace, and World Affairs is a sponsor, as is the Institute for the Study of International Migration that um, Beth Ferris is from, the Initiative on Catholic Social Thought and Public Life, headed up by John Carr, who is here with us, the Center for Social Justice Research, uh, Teaching and Service is a co-sponsor, the Vice President for Global Engagement, the Vice President for Mission and Ministry, and then from off campus, the Jesuit Refugee Service and Catholic Relief Services are all co-sponsoring this event. So we're very grateful for the support of so many groups for our event. So I'm going to begin by asking quest a couple of questions to our panelists. And I will begin uh, with Archbishop Tomasi. We're not going to have a lot of formal presentations, but we hope to have a lot of give and take. And we'll get you into this discussion fairly quickly, I hope. So Archbishop Tomasi, let me begin by asking you, today there are more refugees and migrants in the world than at any, at any time since World War II. This is a really serious crisis on our hands today. And you have been working on this question on behalf of the Catholic Church and on behalf of the, in relation to the United Nations for many years during your time in Geneva and now in Rome. Could you tell us what you see as the major challenges that we face today by the movement of all these refugees and migrants in our world today? How would you describe the chief challenges that we need to face today? You mentioned that uh, we are in the age of migration, and uh, it's exactly that. And there are some 250 million people living and working in countries different from where they were born. And if we add the internal migrants, we have one person in seven that is a migrant in this world. So it's a huge issue. The fact of having so many people float moving across the, the, the globe raises a variety of questions, difficult questions. But I would like, for sake of brevity, to point a couple of them. One is that we should frame the problem in the right way. Mm -hmm. This is the first step. Not to be dominated by emotions or by fear, by the unknown person that comes across the border, but to put the whole question of migration in the proper perspective, looking at the reasons why people move, the policies of the globe community that affect movement of people, and uh, the necessity to accept these people in the context of a are the common good of the people of, or, of the countries of origin and the people of the countries that receive the migrants. And the second point that I would like to, to look at that seems to be very crucial today is how this mobility of the human family affects identities the identities of the countries that receive the immigrants and the fear that, ge that is generated by the pace of change that this brings about. I would think these two issues deserve to be analyzed more in depth. Thank you. We will come back to that. Th those are both very challenging kinds of issues that we will have an opportunity to pursue in some greater depth. Let me turn now to Professor Elizabeth Ferris. Uh, I should tell you, uh, Elizabeth Ferris, Beth Ferris, played an extremely important role at a major event that took place just a little bit over a year ago 
in September of 2016, there was a world summit on migration and refugees at the United Nations General Assembly in New York, which brought together heads of state from all over the world, including then President Obama went. And Ban Ki-moon, who was then Secretary General of the United Nations, prepared a working document for that world summit. It went out under his name, but Beth Ferris wrote it <laughs> and uh, worked closely with all of these countries around the world to formulate an agenda for the world in regard to refugees and migrants. So I'd like to turn to Beth Ferris and say, in light of your experience of working on the World Summit and what has happened at it and since then, what do you think are the biggest challenges that we face, in particular on the part of the international community and the leading countries of the world, like the United States, in responding to the refugee and migration movement of today, in light of your experience at the World Summit and related events? Sure, thanks. And just to talk for a minute about refugees, with part of this much larger movement of people. Yes, we have a refugee crisis, but it is not a crisis of numbers. If you take the 65 million, 40 million are internally displaced people with a whole different set of issues that nobody is talking about. But if you look at the other, we now have 25 million refugees, way too many. But in terms of an increase over recent years, it's two or three million. In a world of seven billion people, this is not a crisis. A million and a half refugees arriving in Europe in 2015 in a region with 650 million people is not a crisis of numbers. What it is is a crisis of a failure of our system, our global system of collective response. And that system is failing badly. You know, this whole fragile refugee framework, legal conventions and so on, developed after World War II, was based on the notion of the common good. It is the collective responsibility to respond when refugees flee terrible situations, not just the responsibility of the countries to which they happen to arrive. You know, when 450,000 Rohingya refugees arrive in Bangladesh in the last month, it shouldn't just be the responsibility of Bangladesh. We all have an interest in setting up systems that respond equitably, fairly, effectively, and not leaving it to the country. So I think we've got a crisis, but it's really a crisis of a system. And frankly, I think it's going to be a very hard sell to get countries of the world, including our own government, to see the collective nature and to see the leadership role that's desperately needed. Thank you, Es. And you could say that it's a crisis of sharing the burden of how to bear, to help those who are in need. Uh, it's not just, uh, not just the immediate response to the refugees, but how do we get the nations of the world to work together to respond to this crisis? Thank you. We'll come back to that as well. Let me turn now to Ludovic Lado for a more, perhaps a more African perspective to this issue. And also, Lado is an anthropologist and knows a lot about the cultural dimensions of the movement of people and so forth. So perhaps, Lado, you could say a few words to us about how you see the movement of people from in Africa that are moving many, there are many people moving from Cote d'Ivoire and other parts of West Africa up through Libya and trying to reach across the Mediterranean uh, it's partly because of issues in their home country, but there's, so there are both push factors and pull factors. Perhaps you could give us a little illumination about the African component about this from your standpoint in Abidjan, in Cote d'Ivoire, or your broader African perspective. Well, um, if we are looking at the West African perspective, uh, which could apply broadly to the African perspective. Um, I would say West Africa has, of course, as you've, you've, you just mentioned, a long tradition of human mobility. And as such, 
it is not a problem uh, originally. It is not a problem. Uh, but of course, if you take into account colonial boundaries, uh, it becomes a problem. Uh, and from the African perspective, the migration and refugee issue, I mean, we have to deal with it at least on two fronts. Um, one is a south-south perspective, because actually the, the, the number of people moving south-south, I mean, within Africa, is far bigger than those trying to get to Europe. So we are, we are, that's the first front. And, and there, of course, you have people who are moving because they want to move, and those who are moving because of uh, uh, some involuntary uh, reasons, and, and, and these are mainly refugees or my, uh, um, labor migrants. And West Africa has a very long tradition of uh, migration for, for, for labor reasons. And, and of course, you have the other front, which is those who are kind of trying to flee, the, to escape from the difficulties or econ mainly economic difficulties they are facing in the context of Africa. And most of the time, these difficulties are related to governance issues. And, 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 and so, um, f f as far as, I mean, as I see it, um, uh, uh, if we deal correctly with the issue of governance in Africa, there will surely be less people wanting to come to the West. Uh, and I've lived in, uh, in Cote d'Ivoire for, for the past uh, five years. And of course, Cote d'Ivoire is today one of the main sources mm -hmm. of young people taking risk, mm -hmm. terrible risks to get, I mean, trying to reach Europe. And, and, um, and so it is a major concern, given the demographics, the demographics of Africa. The, the, I mean, the majority of, great majority of, uh, big majority of the populations, I mean, it's very young. And of course, the, the, the question is, the major question beside the governance issue is, what do you do with these young people? Unless we address that, there will, there will always be people trying or taking risk to kind of get to where they feel that there are better condition, living conditions. And finally, um, uh, uh, this is obviously an international issue, but it, it, it also have local implications because, of course, if, again, you take the case of Côte d'Ivoire, uh, um, they had a ten, almost 10 year crisis from 2002 to 2011. And this crisis was, this crisis was basically rooted in issues of belonging. I mean, who is Ivorian, who is not Ivorian? And those whose citizenship, I mean, was being questioned uh, are migrants who came in from, from, from Burkina Faso, and they have been there for generations. And so here comes a, a, a bunch of politicians, and they are seeking uh, electoral support, and they bring up these issues. You are not Ivorian, uh, and so, and this leads to a number of, I mean, to migration crisis, to identity cr crisis, and as the, 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 the Archbishop was mentioning, so they, it is a multi-layered issue, and, and uh, again, Africa is dealing with it on both fronts, I mean, south-south and then south-north. Good, thank you. I mean, we'll come back. This, okay. this brings up the identity question okay. in a very real way, which the Archbishop raised and both, uh, and is, is a very important question, which leads to these questions of fear and resistance and so forth. So let me turn then to Habon Ali, who was our student panelist uh, this afternoon. As a student at Georgetown, Habon, and as a person who comes from a Muslim background and from a family that has had experience of being migrant and also some of your family being refugees coming from Somalia into Kenya and as being a younger person who could be someone who was 
having a vision of where this can go for the future. Would you want to say something that could be of help to, from your point of view as a student here at Georgetown, on what this issue looks like to you as a, as a Georgetown student and what kind of responses you think might be particularly useful for us to talk about from, uh, from your point of view as a student here? Okay. Um, from my point of view as a student, I would say that um, in addition to just the crisis of refugees, there's a crisis of perception. And I think that, as the Archbishop uh, mentioned, there's that notion of fear and that, that that drives policy, that drives people's understanding of refugees and immigrants who come to this nation. And I think that that's where the discussion lies and that's where um, the need to kind of in interact with these immigrant communities and interact with these refugee communities who majority of the time end up living in siloed um, portions of, 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 of metropolitan area. So um, I, would, I would assume that that's where you know, the, the engagement process is necessary. So you would recommend uh, the, the need for engagement, yes. for people to actually yes. get, some, get to know some refugees yes. or yes. some new people who have yes. come in as migrants recently. Yes. And my experience, and I think there's some data sociologically to show this also, that getting to know a refugee is one of the biggest steps toward having a greater degree of openness toward people coming and recognizing that these people are not such serious threats. And that's related to the identity question. And exactly. you experience that through your own interaction with students here at Georgetown, do you think, that that happens for them? I think that um, many students of Georgetown, you know, they come from uh, middle to upper middle class and affluent um, families. So for them, their first time interacting with someone who's an immigrant or someone who comes from a refugee background, um, is, it, it's intensive. Um, for them, they can't comprehend the, the things that those students have gone through. Um, for example, DACA students, that's a, I know we're, we're gonna discuss that another time as well, but um, you know, like really truly trying to not only empathize, but not, not just sympathizing, but also empathizing, really trying to understand what are the struggles that these students go through um, uh, when, they're, when they're at this university? What are the difficulties that they face? What are the obligations that they have that you don't necessarily have? Um, and I think that for many students at Georgetown, they, don't, they can't really wrap their heads around um, why certain students have to work two jobs or why they have to um, have this family obligation and, and you know, actually even send home uh, money home as well. Um, so for them, they really just, it's that dichotomy. They just can't get themselves to really see um, that, that certain type of lifestyle. It's a very experiential reality yeah. that yeah. Open, helps people re realize yeah. where this situation has a direction that could lead to some solutions. <laughs> Let me turn to another dimension of the issue that we're here to discuss today, since today Pope Francis is launching this uh, Share the Journey campaign in which he is calling upon the resources of the Christian tradition to address the question of refugees. We just heard from Habon how experience of interaction with refugees and migrants can be a source for this but also the Pope is trying to advocate that religious ideas and traditions shaped by religion, Christianity in particular, but I know from my own work that you can look at the Islamic tradition and see that it contains many sources of openness toward those who are migrants and the Jewish tradition. In fact, you look at the three great monotheistic religions of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, all three of them have as among their founding moments a moment of migration, yeah. whether it's the Jewish exodus or the Christian reality of Jesus, Mary and Joseph being driven as refugees to Egypt shortly after Jesus' birth, or in the case of Muhammad, the Hijra, yeah. his movement from Mecca to Medina as a migrant. These are founding moments in our religious traditions. So perhaps we could turn to ways in which religion can play some role in responding to this. 
Archbishop Tomasi, you have been involved in looking at the contribution of the Catholic community to this for many years. Would you say some things to help us see what you think uh, the Christian community in particular and perhaps the Catholic community in, in a special way can make as a contribution to the challenge of uh, solidarity uh, and the collaboration that we need for response to the problems we face on refugees and migrants today. Maybe I can start with a premise that my migration is not a new phenomenon. Although we talk so much about it now in the past few years, the headlines in the newspapers are filled with comments one way or the other about uh, the movement of people. Migration is a natural phenomenon in history mm. that has served to create civilization and it will continue. Mm. That's the, the other part, it's not an emergency. The phenomenon of migration will continue if we look at the demographic imbalances around the world. So this said, from the Catholic tradition, I think the campaign that Pope Francis wants to, that has been launching today, is to add what I could call an ethical, theological dimension to the debate, not just economic or sociological reasons, but there is a previous reasoning that has to be carried out, <coughs> and that is to see why in the wider context of life these people move and what their reasons, mm -hmm. what the just justification they may have. By raising the level of the debate to an ethical and theological debate, it shows the <coughs> wrong approach, the most political, mm leaders have taken in the recent three or four years, five years, in, in uh, manipulating movement of people for political objectives. So the ethical theological dimension eliminates this reasoning. And on the other hand, it gives a new dimension to globalization. It shows that globalization is a phenomenon that, it, first of all, besides communication, besides easy of travel and all that, it's a phenomenon of movement of people and leads us back to the fundamental point that before borders were created, the family of God was one. Mm. And this generates an obligation of solidarity. So the campaign that is begun today is to tell people, look, analyze migration in a proper context. Don't build up a in a wrong objective by creating a fear or by saying that this is new, that this is an exceptional moment. We need to redimension the whole debate and read it in the context of a more realistic approach that comes from an ethical and Christian perspective. Thank you. Beth Ferris, you worked for many years with the World Council on these the Council of Churches and coming from a Protestant Christian tradition and working in an interfaith context for many years on bringing dialogue between religious communities and the migration community and the refugee support community. Can you say anything that you think would be helpful for us in thinking about the role of our religious communities in response to the integration and, and uh, response to the, to the situation we face of so many people on the move? Sure, I mean, I think there are a couple of dimensions. First, just the importance of moral leadership. 
I mean, to have the Pope speaking out on behalf of migrants and refugees is a signal not just to other political leaders of their own shortcomings, but also gives hope to many refugees and migrants who don't feel as forgotten, excluded, abandoned. And, and I think particularly now when I think we, we do have a, almost a vacuum of political leadership globally, with, with two or three exceptions, that this is very timely and important and plays an, an incredibly essential role in this whole debate. But equally importantly is, is what's happening at the local level. I think in this country we've seen the, the polarization in which we live. I know I live in a very comfortable bubble where I talk with most people who think a lot like me. And when I go home to my family in Texas, I realize there is a different world out there. Mm -hmm. But somehow faith communities can bridge that. In you know, my sister's hometown, the churches are really, really strong and people believe and they go and they care and they talk to each other. But what an opportunity to start changing attitudes of, toward migrants and refugees. It's, it's not enough for the leaders of our churches and other faith communities to speak out on behalf of refugees and migrants when our parishes or congregations or other communities are, are full of people who feel very differently. So I think that you know, the role of faith communities is really on both levels, to exercise that moral leadership, but also to do the really difficult task of talking to people within your own faith tradition who have very different views. Frankly, it's much easier for me to talk with progressive Muslims than to talk with very conservative, reactionary uh, Christians in my own tradition. So, but that's the work that needs to be done if we're going to change these, these attitudes. Thank you. Maybe since we're talking a little bit about the interfaith dimension, Abon, as a Muslim, would you have something to suggest that, you, or any observations that you have about the migration and the refugee question that has come forward because of your Muslim experience and your family and, your, and the Georgetown Muslim community's yeah. experience about both the refugee and migrant issue? Um, I would say that uh, Georgetown uh, has developed a bubble for me in which um, there is that interfaith dialogue, there's that um, ability for me to go to my Jewish and um, Protestant or Catholic friends to kind of, you know, get that uh, support that I need whenever I need, but um, that doesn't necessarily exist outside of Georgetown. And I think that that's, as Professor Elizabeth said, that is the foundation in which um, on the local level is where people develop their ideologies. They develop, um, you know, what kind of beliefs that they want to uphold and what kind of, uh, you know, ethics that they want to, you know, raise their children or have their fa um, household in. So kind of working within that, um, allowing <coughs> for not only just congregations, um, excuse me, but I, I think what I was trying to say is I think there's a difficulty for Muslims in the sense of um, we, there's, as um, immigrant and refugee Muslims come to, into the nation, they don't only face the isolation of them being refugees and immigrants, but also there's that dimension of Islamophobia. Right. Right. So when we talk about, you know, diff, you know churches or, or um, different types of um, religious communities coming together, the, qu the question and the conversation is, are the people who um, are refugees and predominantly Muslim there in that conversation? And I think that that's, you know, that's where we start to not only talk about Muslims, but rather hear from them and what they're experiencing in their refugee communities and their migrant communities as well. That's Hearing and really and entering kind of into, a, yeah, into a, a reciprocal yeah, conversation. Yeah. And yeah. that's always yeah. very difficult because if you don't want to listen, you turn exactly. away from people and exactly. don't talk, and exactly. then you never get to the conversation. Exactly. So finding ways to create a framework within which the conversation can begin to take place is really important, it seems yes. to me. Hmm. Yeah. Let me turn to Lado now as an anthropologist. Uh, I, the integration, this is about the identity question, which we have seen is very important, mm -hmm. and it's the, all, of, all of you have brought up this question about how people's sense of who they are can lead them to say, I don't want to be with them, mm -hmm. uh, those others, those other people, whether they're coming as migrants or coming as refugees, whether it's because they're a different religion 
or because they come f with a different skin color or a different language or whatever. Mm -hmm. But I know as an anthropologist, this interaction of cultures and of traditions and so forth has been a big issue in anthropology for a long time. The study of colonialism, for example, has been. But could you say something that, helps, that could help us think about how to deal with this exclusionary impulse that comes out of, out of identity politics and find a way to open ourselves up in a way that would be more creative in response to these issues? Well, um, let me begin by saying that most of the time in Africa, we, we tend to say that we are cultures or, or traditions of hospitality. Mm -hmm. and, and, and this is not just an ideology. It's not just a discourse. Uh, we do have those traditions of hospitality. And I think that everywhere in the world there are traditions of hospitality. And I guess we are kind of, again, struggling with the issue of borders. What is the meaning of borders and or boundaries? Uh, and again, today in Africa, the, we are kind of, again, challenged by, we are still trying to digest colonial boundaries and trying to kind of harmonize it with the issue of hospitality. Uh, uh, and so my, my, my feeling is that the whole, the, the, I mean, the global community, the whole humanity has again to develop some kind of the ethics of hospitality. And I don't know what that would be, but it is surely something we have to look at as a global community. Uh, 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 now, looking at the issue of uh, identity, um, uh, well, I would say it is basically a problem of human encounter. How do you deal with human difference? Uh, because a, a refugee or a migrant is simply, most of the time, especially in the host community, it's just simply somebody who is kind of culturally different from you. And the, 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 the question is, how do you relate how do you handle human difference? And this is always, and it will always be a human question. A, a, uh, you can either choose fear, of course, and shut people out of your space or inner space, or you can choose to face the challenge of encountering human difference and dealing with the challenges which come with it. They go with uncertainties, they go with anxiety. There is nothing, I mean, uh, uh, a, there's no panacea for handling this kind of situation. It's just a matter of saying, well, um, uh, uh, a refugee or a migrant comes with what he is, and of course, on both sides, there, are, there mo I mean, there is a demanding effort to kind of get to mixed, and it can be an a mutually enriching experience just as it can be a mutually destructive experience. Uh, and uh, finally, of course, when you are looking at the ethics of hospitality, hospitality always goes with risks. Because when you are opening your door to a stranger, uh, uh, yes, you are taking a risk. Uh, uh, because you could, of course, it could work well, but it can also um, go wrong. Uh, the issue is, and that is where religious value come into play. Uh, I mean, uh, uh, Mother Teresa used to say, love until it hurts. I mean, can we go that far? That's the problem, I guess. The other thing would be that in many of the religious traditions, certainly in Christianity, um, one of the central messages of the gospel is do not be afraid, a message coming from Jesus and how we bring that to bear upon this interaction and so forth. I'm going to ask one more question of the Archbishop and then open it up to you. So uh, please feel ready to uh, 
make some comments. Am I? We've talked a bit about this issue of those who are different coming in, and I know you mentioned that one of the goals of Pope Francis's campaign is to try to address the issue of integration mm -hmm. of migrants who are coming into a new country or refugees and finding ways to enable them to become integrated into the new country. Uh, and that's a challenge for both those who are coming and those who are hosting, those who are receiving. Mm -hmm. uh, you mentioned this uh, earlier to me in person that this is one of the issues that the Pope is interested in pr promoting is ways that the church could help advance this process of integration. Would you care to say something about that? Because it's directly related to this issue of exclusion and identity and fear and so forth that we've been talking about. Yes, uh, Pope Francis became kind of a voice for the refugees in the vacuum mm -hmm. that we have around the world. And uh, one of the issue is that this voice has been misused sometimes by the media as uh, being one-sided and not uh, realistic. But the realism of the Pope is quite down to earth. And one of the points that he includes in his advocacy role, if we can call it that way, is respect for the society where the immigrants arrive and the refugees arrive. The process of integration is a fundamental change of society. Let's look at the American experience. It's a very concrete experience. Over the last two and a half centuries, different waves of newcomers have modified society, mm -hmm. even in a fairly mm -hmm. fundamental way. The political structure has remained, but the cultural structure and the expression of life has changed. Now, Europe is facing the same music in the sense that a lot of newcomers are, are arriving, and because of demographic reason, they are welcome in a way by the economy, by the age structure of society, the need to balance off the, the age structure. But they are not acknowledged as such. So we need to build a new identity, talking of identity as Father Lado said, in a, in a creative way. The talents and the forces and the contributions that the newcomers bring about have to be utilized to develop a new identity. The identity of a people is anyway in constant evolution. Mm -hmm. So we need to be realistic enough not to accuse the newcomers of being the cause of evils right. or dis discomforts that they are not responsible for, but simply utilize the new energy and channel it into a new creative solution. The experience of countries like the United States, like Canada, like Australia, like Brazil, where the effort to integrate and use the positive contribution of newcomers was put to good use, develop societies that are doing quite all right by any standard. So that's where the challenge is even for, the, for this moment. This applies to Europe, this applies even to some big movements in Africa, sure. because as Father Lado said, there is a heavy inter-country migration even in Africa. As someone who lived in Boston for many years, I can tell you that um, I have experience of ways that immigrants can change the culture of a particular region in a very positive way. The contribution of Irish Catholics to the Boston system is very dramatic. 
If they had never come, Boston would not be what it is today. <laughs> and many of those living in Boston would say it would be much less desirable to be there than it is today. <laughs> anyway, but there, we have to remember that this integration process has taken place in the United States for many, many generations, as the Archbishop has said. I would like, yes, right. could you, you want to, with, with by, a, by all means. With a little story. I lived in Sweden for a couple of years, which is a fantastic country, and I, I was talking with an Iraqi refugee there, and there at that time, and this was before 9-11, back in the 90s, I guess, um, it, th at that time, refugees got three years of full support to learn the language. The salary that a refugee was making was the same as I was making as research director for a peace institute. Um, you know, their kids had the right to education in their own language. They had full access to medical care, no questions. And I talked to this Iraqi refugee, and he said, how do I get to the United States? And I said, you are crazy. <laughs> Why do you want to come to the United States? And, you know, we have, you know, six months of medical, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and he looked at me and he said, because my kids could be American. And I feel like in Sweden, at that time at least, I feel like I will always be seen as strangers, as different. And this idea that America can absorb and welcome and change in response to, I think that's a very precious thing we've had and that we're in danger of losing with this current climate. It's not, it's a question of losing part of our identity. It isn't just a, a policy issue, if you will. Right, and I mean, yesterday I was doing a session with another class here at, at Georgetown and we were talking about some of the religious uh, ideas that lead to uh, support for refugees and migrants, one of which is if you go to the book of Deuteronomy and uh, it's, it's all th through the, the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament, in the Hebrew scriptures it says love your neighbor as yourself once and neighbor in that case means your fellow Israelite or your fellow Jew, but 35 times it says love the stranger in your midst. There's a much bigger stress on that. And it then goes on to say, because you were once strangers in Egypt, remember that you treat those who are now strangers among you. And I asked the students about that and they went through their family histories. And one was an Armenian who came, the fam her family came fleeing the Armenian genocide. Mm -hmm. Another was an Irish Catholic whose family came fleeing the potato famine. And it went on around the classroom, many, many people. So you remember where we came from, and that's right. an essential part of our identity in this country. And uh, that's one of the distinctive qualities of the United States that should make us open to greater integration. So I would like now to turn to the, the audience and get more of you involved in interacting. I would ask you if you're going to raise a question to stand and we have a microphone here. Tell us who you are and uh, a word, very brief word about where you're from and then ask a question. We are not looking for long disquisitions, but a question and tell us who the question is directed to. Yes, right here in the cool. third row. Um, my name is uh, Deacon Clayton Nickel. I'm the son of an uh, immigrant. Um, I am um, a prime deacon at the Cathedral of St. Matthew the Apostle. And my question is, I, I'm getting a little bit of a difference between migrant and refugee. Okay. Um, I'm also a social, anthrop social anthropologist, so perhaps that's where it comes from. Um, my question is, for many refugees want to go home. We're talking about migrants, and we're sort of swimming between migrants for those who can't go home mm. and those who want to go home. And I'm thinking particularly of, let's say, the Christian refugees or all those other refugees, the, the, the Yazdis and the other religious minorities in the Middle East or elsewhere, who have this memory of wanting to go home. And I, could we, uh, there seems to be a real tension between the two. And could perhaps Good, do you have address someone that. you'd like to address that to? Just as a general discussion, because okay. I think it's Beth, would you like to your respond to that? Family memory of Somalia, or perhaps a family memory of a place where one used to be, because that can be a point of uh, real contention, and it can also be a point of, of aggression where people want to take back the country that they lost or something like this. So I just wanted 
generally address those two issues and see whether there's a Good. distinction or not. Thank you. Thank you. Um, this is perhaps the most burning issue in the field, is the difference between refugees and migrants and whether refugees should have a preferential claim to enter a particular country. The 1951 Refugee Convention provides a clear definition of who's a refugee. Countries which have ratified it now, about 145, have agreed they won't send people back to situations where their lives are in danger. For migration, it's a very different story. Migrants, and most migration, we should emphasize, is good. You know, most people, most of the world's migration is legal, it's orderly, it's because people want to study or join family or take another job. So I think all of us have been migrants at one time or another, and probably half of the, half of you listening. I mean, migration in itself is not a bad thing. What's bad is when people are forced to move, whether because of politics or desperate poverty. And that line in actuality between people fleeing to survive because of poverty and those fleeing to survive because of violence gets awfully murky, and our systems aren't very good at distinguishing. One issue I would add to that is that one of the tragic situations about refugee movement today, although many would want to go back, the average duration of refugee displacement is now up above 15 years and it's come to be called protracted displacement. And that means that many of the refugees that we're talking about in the world today are not going home. And that raises the issue then of integration mm -hmm. and finding ways to open up the doors to enable. And this is what has led to, in some of the refugee discussion, to saying that there's a big challenge to find ways to really enable refugees who have moved to a country to begin to become part of the local economy and that maybe not just keeping them in camps but finding places where they can get a job, where they can find permanent housing, that these sorts of things are ways of responding to the crisis that really is uh, a new challenge. The old days were keeping all the refugees in a refugee camp and then hoping that the, the, the so-called durable solution was repatriation may not be where the situation is today. I don't know. That's <laughs> one angle of looking at it. It's not to say going home is not a good idea, but it may not be possible in many circumstances. Mm -hmm. Other questions and observations that you would like to raise, by all means. Yes, the lady here in, yes, please. I'm a religious of the Sacred Heart, and I'm the JPIC Justice and Peace Coordinator for our congregation. I'm thinking there's a huge connection with the environment and migration and refugees, and that the question of going home is going to become moot as people have to move away from areas that are no longer viable. I wondered if you had seen this already and how big a role you think this might be about to play in our future, and this can mm. be addressed by anybody who wishes. Archbishop, would you like to say something about the relation of refugees to environment questions li given at Laudato Si or well, any of the other panelists would be welcome to say something as right. well? Some, some of the projections mm -hmm. are that in the next uh, 20, 30 years there will be hundreds of thousands of people forcibly displaced by ecological change. Mm -hmm. Now. This raises a new question. What is the ethical responsibility of the international community to take in these people who are displaced by the rising water for some islands in the Pacific or by some other, like the Sahel, the destruction of the arable land? Mm. Uh, this uh, raises a, a new category of refugees, if we may use the word refugees, they do not fall under the existing no. legal system, but we need to develop uh, measures. We need to develop a way of taking care of these people because they have to be assisted in resettling somewhere. 
you care to comment? Just to say that this is already happening. Most of the displacement is internal in the United States and Alaska. There are indigenous communities that cannot survive where they are. In southern Louisiana, there are coastal communities getting ready to move lock, stock, and barrel because they cannot exist where they are. And our legal systems and structures aren't set up to deal with this cross-border, whether it's in the case of the Pacific Islands or elsewhere, is even more complicated. But most governments are saying, oh, we don't want to go there in, in terms of thinking about some protocol or agreement to deal with people displaced by environmental change, including climate change. Climate change is also a contributing factor to conflict mm -hmm. in a number of regions. You mentioned the Sahel. Uh, but you can go back to the Darfur crisis in, in uh, Sudan. Sudan, and it's pretty clear that some of the conflict that took place there had something to do with the, mo the, the decline of water supplies that made herders or pastoralists and, and agriculturalists come into conflict with each other and leading to the conflict that generated the tar terrible of events that took place in Darfur. Now, it's not only climate change that did that, right. but it was part of it. Mm -hmm. And uh, this has led a man, uh, again, in Oxford named Alex Betts to develop, write a book called uh, Survival Migrants. This is, refugees are people fleeing persecution, but there are people fleeing a whole range of other issues where their survival is at stake, whether it's famine, or extreme poverty, or environmental displacement. And Betts doesn't think, and I don't think, that opening up the debate about revising the Refugee Convention is a good idea, because in this context of today, if we started debating the Refugee Convention, we'd probably make it more restrictive yeah. rather than more inclusive. Mm -hmm but maybe finding a way to say we have ethical duties, not just to those fleeing persecution, but to those seeking refuge from other sources of threat to their well-being. Others, uh, yes, over in the, Mark, over in the side there, would you like to raise a, com a comment or a question? And please address, address it to one of the panelists if you would like to. Thank you, David. Uh, Father Mark Bosco, Mission and Ministry. And it's, it's, it's really, to, I guess, the question of identity that Lado brought up, but also something that you brought up about, uh, about Europe and identity uh, there. It was, this summer I was in Lucca, Italy, with some Italian friends. And one, one piece was, well, can we have an African-Italian? That you know, our state, our country only existed since 1870 something. I mean, we but we go back in our blood all the way back to you know the Lucchese, blah blah blah. But they were they were really talking about is this even a possibility? It was, it was a very sad conversation to be part of, being an American in which ideas and virtues kind of create that. So I was wondering how that works. Are your experience of that are, are, are about how that identity goes? At that same week that I was there, I was talking to someone who said the criminal activity about moving migrants and taking care of migrants, especially uh, in Italy, uh, that where, the, where the mafia really kind of controls so much of that and is taking so much money from the EU and is taking so, that there's a real sense of, of desperation uh, in the towns around Lucca. So we didn't talk about that. So the question I guess is what about this kind of criminal activity about uh, making money off of the movement of, of, of refugees? Uh, and, and maybe a little bit more on what, how can one be an Italian African. I mean, what are the ways forward to kind of have that conversation? Thank you. Um, we we'll let what? both the Italian and the Africans. <laughs> 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 yes. Well, we tend to say that Africa is the cradle of humanity, which means that, of course, all of you are Africans, basically. <laughs> <laughs> <So>. <laughs> but yes. Um, um, Again, I don't know, somebody was talking the other day at a conference about the, the, the browning of the U.S. I mean, that there are more and more brown people in the U.S., which means that I personally believe that the future of humanity is a future of métissage, as they say in French, that... Mestissage in yeah, Spanish, yeah. which is... Uh, it is... It takes a long time, but... It's happening that people move and mix and 
I mean, the world become more colorful. I mean, it is, <laughs> for me, it is good news. And, and so I just, yes, African Italian or Italian African, I see it as, yes, the future of the world, basically. So you care to say something about that? Uh, Bishop well, Tomasi? There, there is some <laughs> criminal activity related to the arrival of migrants. Well, the Italians are very creative. <laughs> <laughs> and if there are new occasions to make money, they, they will <laughs> do it. But that's a, a marginal phenomenon. Sure. Uh, that is very much uh, in the agenda of the, of the police, of the state, uh, to be careful that uh, taking care of the newly arriving refugees may not be exploited by illegally by somebody to make money. That is a fact. But it's interesting that uh, a bit different from the other European countries, Italy has adopted a system of integration that is spreading out of the new arrival throughout the population without allowing ghettos to be developed. Hmm. And this has smoothed out the process of integration in a very constructive way. So there is, uh, there is some uh, shady business going along, but there is also a very positive approach and uh, Italy has been taking in basically a, a lot of people that otherwise would have been lost at sea or uh, found to become under control of traffickers. One of the things that I have read about uh, with some of the studies that have been done about some of the terrorist attacks that have taken place in France in recent years, the Charlie Hebdo attack and some of the others since then have been done from Muslim indigenous people to France, yeah. but who felt deeply alienated from French society because they had not been welcomed. They had not been integrated. Yeah. And uh, not so much, you know, people coming from ISIS in Iraq, or, but rather people who had been in France for some time, but who had several generations of experience of not being treated like French people. And um, we have experience of this in the United States, of course. I made a rather humorous reference to Irish Catholics in Boston, but blacks in Boston have a different experience. Mm. If you go back to what happened with the busing crisis, where there was a lot of antipathy toward people with a different color skin. So this integration and welcoming is very different. And the, I am hopeful about <laughs> the multicoloring of our world. <laughs> But it's not as easy as you sure. might think, either in the United States, yeah. sure. where look at Charlottesville yeah. and what happened there and uh, so forth. So, if, yes. If I may speak, um, I would actually kind of mention that uh, when we talk about an African Italian, we're focusing on the concept of assimilation versus integration. And I think that I personally have experienced that where many people would be like, no, you're an American. But then I'm like, no, but I'm also Kenyan and I'm also a Muslim woman, but I'm also a black woman as well. So when, you know, as we're talking about integration, I think that for many immigrants and for many um, refugees, they feel that they have to strip away all of who they are to try to be a part of the society. So it is upon the, the host nation to try to as you, as you mentioned in the Charlie Hebdo attack, it wasn't necessarily the refugees who came there, but rather the people who have lived there, generations, like fourth generation French um, citizens who don't see themselves as French because the French society has decided for them not to be French enough. So it's that question of enough. Are, are, we, are immigrants and refugees ever going to be enough to be able to be a part of the fabric of the society? 
other questions? Yes. Uh, Catherine Marshall from the Berkeley Center. I think you've made collectively a very persuasive case that the system is pretty broken. Um, but maybe, Beth, um, where do you think the lines are in terms of reform of the system, both in terms of what you might imagine or dream of, uh, but also any viable process or any prospect of moving ahead? The last year's summit in the New York Declaration called for the establishment of two new global compacts. You know, the word compact, a little bit looser than a convention, but some kind of consensus to develop one on migration and one on refugees, to really look at ways of transforming the system, to improve the system. You know, this is a big year. This is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. I don't think we'll see this in the next 20 years mm -hmm. where 193 countries said it's time to change the system. We'll give you a year to come up with a new plan. The jury's still out on whether or not they're going to come up with transformation or just tinker at the seams, but, but there are a lot of people in governments and civil society and faith communities, academics who are all thinking, how do we use this opportunity? Mm -hmm. How can we get in there something that would have more effective responsibility sharing that would create more legal pathways for migration? So it's a wonderful opportunity in the next year. And I, I think some of us are following this very closely, but it's going to require, um, require some leadership. And we'll see what happens on that one. The mention of the Global Compact, which was in both of these documents last year, uh, a couple of things that were included there that I would just mention that seemed to me to be extremely important was the need for serious response to, integrate, to, to provide education for refugee children in a very really serious way. Because, and that has something to do with integration, finding ways to enable these people. To <coughs> Another question that emerges is, is how are we going to deal with really assisting the countries mm -hmm. that are receiving most of the refugees in the right. world? Mm -hmm. If you look at Syria, which is one of the major sources of refugee movement, it's surrounded by Jordan and Lebanon and Turkey. And those countries have huge numbers of refugees. Also, now the most recent movement of refugees from South Sudan into Uganda. Mm -hmm. Uganda is a poor country. Mm -hmm. Or the movement of Rohingya from Myanmar. Myanmar into Bangladesh. Bangladesh is one of the poorest <laughs> countries of the world. And it's now got almost a million Rohingya people coming across its border. Those countries are not able to provide the assistance needed for these people. And if they don't have assistance, they're going to get really mad. I always say one of the best places in the world to grow a terrorist is a refugee camp, especially if people have been there for a long time. Look at Palestinians what's happened there, and they've been there multiple generations. So find, and those, that's just one other piece that was in the, the Global Compact of finding ways to deal with this. I don't know whether you yeah. would want to mention other things like that. The bishop one? Bishop, bishop yes. Add a footnote. The Compact for Migration and the Compact for Refugees are part of the campaign that the Pope has launched oh, nice. today. Because, as Elizabeth mentioned, mm -hmm. it's the opportunity to affect the policies of the international community and therefore of all the state regarding a way of handling in a civilized way the movement of refugees, asylum seekers, migrants, and so forth. Uh, we're going to come to a conclusion in a minute. Um, or in 10 minutes, I guess, is when our deadline is. But uh, one of the things that I would like to invite our panel to do some final reflections for on for this audience would be we're at a university where we have significant resources academically, intellectually, 
and in educational programs for students and others. I'd like to invite our panelists to suggest what they think, both as faculty members, but also as students, might be a good response that could be initiated here at Georgetown, either by faculty in terms of their teaching or their research, and by students in terms of their study and their service, of some ways that we might be able to undertake some initiatives that could make a difference here from Georgetown as located here where we are. Maybe we could start with Beth and just go right around the panel here and end with the Archbishop. Would you like to suggest some things in that regard? Sure. Beth? I think some of the organizations that are sponsoring today's event have also agreed to work together over the course of the next year to have other you know, seminars and workshops to really educate ourselves on some of these issues, whether it's climate change and displacement or what's happening in a particular country. Um, students, I mean, students have this great organization now called Lo No Lost Generation where they're really focusing on education of refugees and some of the advocacy work that can be done. Advocacy is needed, but also simply talking to friends and family back home in places where attitudes may be different about the importance of these issues, I think, is key. Okay, thank you. Lotto, would you have any suggestions? I mean, even, even with regard to research issues or sure. ed, uh, teaching issues and so forth that might be relevant. Well, first of all, a word of encouragement because, uh, of course, um, I've just been here for just over a month. And um, just to kind of encourage, the, I mean, Georgetown community or university, uh, 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 with regard to its sen sensitivity to inclusiveness and to the, its commitment to fighting any kind of discrimination and um, even this DACA issue coming up, it's mm -hmm. the support it's willing to give to the students who, who could be affected. So, I mean, it speaks to its values. I mean, mm -hmm. uh, and this is something which is kind of heartening in terms of a, a, an educational institution, the, the kind of values it tries to put across and even uh, 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 get across to, to younger generations. And, and of course, the universities are good at teaching and doing research. That's the best they can do. Um, uh, and I would also simply encourage, basically, the, the universities focus on issues of ethics and justice because most of the time we tend to focus on short-term policies and uh, and so research basically lo looking at yes deeply at push and pull factors uh, and again bringing justice and ethics issue on, in, on on board, I mean, it's an added value, and it could broaden basically the horizons of policymakers and politicians, which are often caught up in short-term uh, issues to be addressed. Uh, I mean, I was looking at the New York Times today, and basically, what politicians are interested in are issues of cost and security. I mean, that's all they're interested in, cost and security. But um, I get. Academy, I mean, <coughs> intellectuals can kind of help them broaden their horizon and look at this as a human issue, not just as a political issue. Thank you. Abon, would you like to make a suggestion or some suggestions about what we might do better here at Georgetown, both for the refugee and migration issue, both for students and faculty? I would say that um, one issue is to not necessarily act when there's, when when the only time you act is when something bad happens, right. that shows something, right? So we shouldn't wait until we see a crisis for all of us to hurdle together and figure out what we should do, but rather actually create the necessary resources so that people who are impacted by those crises, either that being um, immigrants who face Islamophobia or DACA students on this campus, um, can find that social safety net on, on, on our campus. There are so many different organizations who can get involved on campus, especially if you're interested in you know, helping in what I call uh, securitization of hope 
in the sense of education is equalization into actually, you know, fulfilling your full potential. And if you're interested in that, you know, there's a center of social justice where you can <coughs> volunteer um, and to help, you know, immigrant communities and their children um, learn English or help to be a tutor. Mm -hmm. um, little things like that that mm. help that you don't think is contributing. This is more to the young students, but you don't think it's contributing much to the society, but it really is. Because um, at the end of the day, if we talk about integration, it's about through education policies. It's about how, personally, from my experience, how I had to work five times harder than most students to not only learn English, but also to be at the level in which I needed to be. You know, so just things like that. Thank you, Abon. Archbishop, would you have any suggestions for us as, as a university <laughs> here that ways that we could be, in particular, assistance to the church in this area? Some good ideas have already been said. I would uh, add to, to the university as an environment of research study, a more objective kind of place. And it should be the place where the proper framework of the question of migration can be developed. Mm -hmm. So that uh, not emotions, not the fears, not approximate uh, information is the base for policy, but a more comprehensive, more objective, and more detached, I would say, uh, framework should be developed. And second, maybe some of the students can uh, spend some time to know the refugee community or the ethnic groups just arrived, immigrant groups, because the personal contact yeah. changes the, the whole way of looking at reality. So a direct experience, I've seen some young people moving uh, to some African countries or some other activities, mm. changing their, all, the, their whole person approach to life. If there is a direct contact between students and refugees, between students and immigrants, mm. I think that will go a long way to build a, a new approach to coexistence. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you all very much to our members of the panel. I would just conclude by saying that this is the first of a set of panels that, and discussions that we're going to be conducting here at Georgetown on the issue of refugees and migration. Uh, there is the Berkeley Center is going to be sponsoring another event in middle October, and we will publicize that, send the word out on the Internet uh, to let you well know about it. And the, uh, the, the in initiative for Catholic social thought uh, and public life uh, will be hosting uh, Cardinal Tobin later in this year. Cardinal Tobin has been a real leader in the American Catholic community on response to refugees and migrants. And there will be several other events in the near future. So you will keep your eye uh, posted. Uh, I look looking out for communication and posters that will be around campus. And we will continue the discussion uh, in the near future. So I would like on behalf of everyone is here in particular to thank Archbishop Silvano Tomasi for coming uh, all the way from Rome for our, our panel today. Uh, Abona, Abona Lee, our student participant, Ludovic Lado, and Beth Ferris. Thanks to the whole panel. Thank you. Bravo.